<laughs> well, such an honor to speak with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, it's all good. I feel very honored by your uh, T-shirt. Oh, yes. I, I wore my London shirt today for you. How's very, that? Very patriotic. Thank I'm, you. Uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. First off, thank you so much. Love, love, love the book. I admired your work from afar for so long. And just so excited to have you on the show. Well, that's very kind of you. I look forward to it. Thought we could just maybe discuss the big idea. There's so many big ideas in this book. We'll kind of walk through the book, the big ideas, and uh, and okay. uh, work for you. Cool. Looking awesome. forward to it. Cool. We'll get started. Here we go. Lord Andrew Roberts, welcome to the show. Thank you very much indeed, Jay. It's it's good to be on the show, Andrew. It is such an honor to have you on, Andrew. For our listeners who may not be familiar with you and your work. Who are you and what do you do? I'm an historian and I've been writing history books for uh, 30 years now. I've written books about Winston Churchill, Napoleon, Your Last King, George III, and, uh, and various other things like that. I'm a professor at uh, King's College London, a visiting professor at the uh, Military History department there. And I'm a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and a distinguished fellow of the New York Historical Society. So I, I like to sort of straddle both sides of the Atlantic as much as I possibly can. Andrew, I've admired your work from afar for so long. Just some epic biographies, The Storm of War, The Last King of America, Napoleon, Churchill, my favorite little book ever, The Leadership in War, such an amazing book. But the reason that we are together today is to discuss your latest work, which is amazing. Your work with General David Petraeus, Conflict, the Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to the Ukraine. I got to start off by saying that it was the fastest 18 hours and 27 minutes I've ever spent on Audible. Uh, it was... <laughs> Yes, was, David David reads the uh, Iraq and Afghanistan chapters, uh, doesn't he? Which crazy. which was a, a wonderful thing to do because it takes quite a long time to to do that those readings, and uh, it was it was great that he he did. I think it's much more immediate when you can actually hear his voice. It is so surreal listening to him speak about like his war. It's like a history, but it's also like reflective. It, it's crazy. But let's get to the book. First off, the, one of the beginning quotes I just love kind of sets the tone. I think it's from Von Klaus all more. You, he writes, war is politics by other means. And I believe you mentioned just as politics has not ended in 19, just as politics had not ended in 1945, neither has the evolution of warfare. So quick, big question. I believe this may be your first book you ever co-authored with someone. Yeah, um, yeah. How did you and uh, General Petraeus, uh, the author of The Surge and uh, director of the CIA here in the United States, how did you guys get together and how did the book come to be? Well, it was soon after the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, that I came up with the idea. And so I got on to David, who I'd known for years, um, in fact, and we'd uh, um, interviewed each other on various uh, public uh, platforms uh, over the years. And I said, look, there are going to be plenty of books about the politics and the geopolitics of uh, the Russo-Ukrainian war. But why don't we write a book just on the military history aspects of it, putting the war in its uh, historical context, essentially, and uh, looking at the precedents for the various things that uh, that happen in this war? And he uh, immediately jumped at the idea, which was wonderful. And uh, we got Harper Collins, the publishers, who understandably wanted to know how we were going to divvy up the chapters. And I said, "Well, David's going to write about all the countries he's invaded, and uh, I'm going to do the rest." He actually also did the Vietnam uh, chapter, which is obviously a very important chapter in the book. And then once we had written our respective chapters, we sent them backwards and forwards to one another. So exchanged literally thousands of emails in the course of writing the book, which was fascinating for me, because although I'd been a military historian, as you so kindly mentioned earlier, I'd never been on a battlefield and um, certainly never commanded uh, uh, anybody. So it was fascinating to get into the mind of somebody who had commanded 190,000 coalition troops in these two enormous areas of uh, of modern conflict. What I found so remarkable about the book, like you mentioned earlier, it's not a political book. It's not politics saying this is bad, this is great. It's, the it's a history book. 
it's a strategy book. It's a leadership book. It's just like a psychology book, like the psychology of a leader that just covers the big ideas of seven decades of global conflict. Before we get into the big ideas, you have so much knowledge of all the people you wrote about Churchill, Napoleon. What did you learn writing this book? Is there a perspective that you had entering that may have changed as you researched and wrote? Oh, so many on so many levels. Absolutely. No, no, no. It was a it was a learning curve, big learning curve for uh, me. I um I think the key one was how important strategic leadership is. You can be let's take the uh, Chinese Civil War for a moment. For a moment, you mentioned earlier about uh, Clausewitz in 1945 and and so on. You know, the first chapter we call the death of the dream of peace because people did think in 1945 that with this horrific war that had cost 16 million lives and uh, ended with the dropping of the two atomic bombs um once that had happened people understandably part of natural part of human nature thought you know that we've got to now come across come up with a way to abolish war and uh far from that happening of course only uh, within a year of the war breaking out, uh, sorry, the war um, ending, uh, you have the Chinese Civil War in 1946, which uh, led to the deaths of around six million people. And one of the fascinating things about that war, which uh, we discovered actually was, was true of many, many wars, if not all of them, is that strategic leadership is more important than how many men you have when the war breaks out, which cities you control when the war breaks out, what kind of um, weaponry you've got vis-a-vis -vis your opponent. All of those things, you know, which you'd have thought would ultimately um, decide the, uh, the the conflict. No, it's the way in which the um, leaders on each side uh, try to get the, the big ideas of the, of the war right and the way in which they then use these uh, strategic insights into um, defeating the enemy. And, uh, and David employed a, um, uh, a concept that he'd come up with at the Belfer Centre in, uh, in at Yale University um, to, uh, uh, to sort of define and refine these um, uh, concepts of strategic leadership. So what we've done essentially is to apply them to all of the most important um, struggles since the uh, since uh, 1945, and we've and we've tried to do it in as sort of scientific a way as uh, as possible. And um, it's very kind of you to make or say all these kind things about my book, which, needless to say, it's a, it's a delight to hear. First off, you're welcome. One of my big takeaways of this book, the four rules of strategic leadership. So one, get the big ideas right, right? That's number one. Secondly, the leader has to communicate the big ideas. Then you have to implement the ideas, but then you're not done there. You have to keep continually refine those ideas, correct? What, what could you add to right. that? Exactly, that's right, yeah. And and also you've got to be doing it all at the same time, essentially, and uh, often under fire, you know, whilst mm. the, uh, and the enemy always has a say in, uh, in what yeah. uh, happens in a war so that's so that's changing the big ideas um might uh, be changing as well as a result of the way in which the uh, war's being fought but you're absolutely right the key thing is to get the get the sort of and what, by big ideas what we mean is the um the underlying strategy for how to win mm -hmm. uh, to understand what kind of a war you're fighting um, and uh, and it's it's very surprising how often actually uh, people just don't get that right. I mean, the uh, United States in Vietnam for the first uh, thirteen years of that war, they were essentially trying to refight the Korean War mm -hmm. rather than trying to fight a counterinsurgency um, war, which is what the uh, Vietnam War was all about, frankly. So you have to have this sort of overall. Uh, analysis. And General Abrams by 1968 had got that, but frankly, it was it was almost too late by then. So that's very important. Then, as you say, the communication, everybody must understand throughout the length and breadth of the organisation yep. uh, what it's all about. And the people who are capable of doing that need to be promoted. And the people who, who frankly, are not uh, measuring up, they need to be moved on to something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, And then you've got to um, the, the key fourth part of the uh, of the concept is that you've got to adapt it endlessly and see what's working and what isn't, and obviously to reinforce the former and uh, and cut the latter.
Yep. And and you're doing all this as the enemy's attacking and you're constantly facing the end in the middle of the fire, like you said. One of the things I'm so not so surprised, but you look at like you look through, I forget the quote, like one thing we learn through history is that people do not learn through history. Uh, and um, like how surprised well, I've actually funny enough here on my desk. Really? Well, sorry, just next to my desk here. I've got a, a letter from Aldous Huxley, which he wrote in 1959. And in it, I've got it framed by my desk because I think it's it's so important for historian. And uh, what he wrote was that men do not learn from the lessons of history is the most important of all the lessons that history has to teach us. Wow, that's so true. If you look, uh, if, like just taking your your past works, you take um, if you read Napoleon and you read Churchill, right? The one thing I learned is you don't invade Russia. Like don't <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, like exactly. don't invade Russia. It's a bad idea. Right. And don't do that. But they keep every couple of decades. Someone else thinks it's a great idea to do it. Right. Like, it's crazy. How surprising is it how constantly the errors of history and conflict keep repeating itself? Um, well, that is, of course, one of the reasons for having history. That's why, you know, history or at least the, what we call applied history mm -hmm. is such an important um, subject. But actually, one of the other things that came through very strongly in uh, our book was how much uh, thoughtful generals and you know intelligent strategic leaders actually did look at uh, history. A classic example being the Yom Kippur War mm -hmm. of 1973, where the Pentagon, after that war was over, it's an extraordinary conflict. The uh, Arab armies attacked Israel, surprise attack, very very impressive surprise attack, mm -hmm. and uh, but quickly Israel was able to reconstitute and and fight back and and essentially win that war decisively, and so what the Pentagon did was in 1973 was to set up no fewer than 36 reports where people would go out, American officers would go out to the Middle East and try to work out what happened in that war, and and how the lessons could be learned for future, of course, desert, in this case, uh, fighting. And over the next 17 years, these ideas were refined and they were put into practice. And you have, by the time of the Gulf War in 1990, a, a pretty impressive war-winning formula. So people, generals can, they're, they're not always fighting the last war. They can be looking forward and concentrating on how best to fight the next one. Another big idea I took out of the book is the value of spending money on the front side of deterrence, where I think you mentioned money spent on deterrence is rarely, is usually well spent. Could you speak to that? Yes, yes. Rarely wasted. Um, rarely wait, yep. Now, that's not to say that money... Uh, is never wasted. Of course, huge amounts of money are put into projects and uh, systems that don't ultimately work. Uh, but the key thing is that you've got to be constantly looking to the future and trying to become, to stay, in America's uh, case, state of the art, uh, especially now that warfare is going to be so different in the future than it has been in the past. Staying at the cutting edge is going to be vital for the West. And that's why we had our last chapter called The Future of Warfare, Chapter 10, mm -hmm. yep. which is about drones, of course, and AI, robotics, space, cyber, uh, sensors, all of these various aspects and, and others, uh, propaganda, of course, also uh, misinformation and disinformation, which are going to be very important aspects of, of future conflict. And we go into them uh, as much as possible for, for the, precisely the reason that you mentioned. And regarding on the future of war, another big idea I took from there, the book gives a glimpse of what future wars may look like. But one of the things I thought was interesting, a big quote I took from the book is war evolves, but it does not ossify. It's capable of suddenly and shockingly being thrown into reverse. And I think maybe Rwanda might have been a, a, an example of that. Well, Rwanda just... certainly where, you know, you're, you're in the mid 1990s and suddenly you've got a war that comes down to machetes, you know, people being massacred with machetes. But we're seeing that uh, at the moment, of course, with, with the Ukraine war, where in the Donbass region you have barbed wire, trenches uh, and so on that are more reminiscent essentially of the First World War mm -hmm. than, of, than of the more modern 
conflicts in the uh, Iran-Iraq War of 1980 to 88, it became very clear that uh, the evolution of warfare was not linear and it could be sort of shunted into a sideline for a long time, in this case, eight years, where there was gas and, and barbed wire and tanks and trenches and so on. So it was a real sort of throwback, essentially, to the to World War One, seventy 70 years before. Then you have some wars that are paradigm shift wars. Ukraine is also one of those. So as well as in the Donbass having a, a very old war being what Max Boot, the military historian Max Boot called All Quiet on the Western Front meets Blade Runner. Um, That's a great and, quote. Uh, it's a, a great, great it's a great line. And it's so yeah. right because you also see all the latest technologies being employed in in Ukraine. And you I think the U, Russo-Ukrainian war is going to be one of those paradigm shifting wars like Yom Kippur was that will remind people that that warfare can suddenly take leaps forward and evolve very very quickly Mm -hmm. and and that's something that we found look these wars that we chose were not necessarily the biggest ones they weren't necessarily the most important politically um, but they were the ones that showed how war was evolving and uh, and how wars would be fought in the future. So so there are plenty of, um, of very you know important conflicts that we uh, we don't cover in the book because it's not intended to be a comprehensive history of all wars since 1945, of which there have been over 140. Oh, wow. Let's stay on the Ukraine war for a second. Like getting back to the big idea of strategic leadership is everything. I believe you called Zelensky Churchill with an iPhone, right? Uh, that was a, that was a friend of mine actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, called Jonathan Friedland in one of the British papers. Uh, yeah, called him uh, Churchill with an iPhone. I think it's a brilliant uh, it's a brilliant phrase. I think um, Zelensky showed uh, all of the of the best sort of Churchillian features of leadership in those opening months of the war you know staying in kiev mm-hmm. uh telling people he needed ammunition not a ride yeah. keeping his family in kiev um making sure that uh, all ukrainians of military age uh, stayed in the country male ones stayed in the country to fight and taking the um the the fight to the enemy he's obviously got a tremendously difficult uh, position now because the um, counteroffensive in the south has been blunted, uh, partly by Russian drones, but also obviously by by miles and miles of minefields. And the big idea is something that might be uh, starting to shift in uh, in Ukraine, and it uh, is looking less and less likely that you're going to get large sweeping flanking tank maneuvers on Russian flanks getting through to the Sea of Azov and cutting off Crimea. So it's a war in progress, needless to say. Yeah. I understand. Did you and General Petraeus visit Kiev? Did you? We did. Yeah, we we went out there to meet uh, various generals and, and ministers to talk about the war. It was a profoundly moving experience because we also went to Butcher and to Irpin, which were the scenes of two of the most notorious massacres of civilians, Ukrainian civilians, by Russian soldiers and saw the mass graves there and so on. Um, So it was ghastly, frankly, but it does remind you, of course, that war is hell. And uh, although it's very interesting to write about it, you know, there is a human aspect to it that is just utterly horrendous. Yeah. And you mentioned about the strategic leadership with Zelensky. Like, I believe he was the first wartime leader to address both houses of Congress and Churchill. I believe that might might have been mentioned in the book. I just love you said like a big idea. Like he's like, I I need ammunition, not a ride. That told the world basically that he wasn't going to be like the Afghan president who basically shoved as much uh, cash as many dollars into a suitcase in his under his helicopter and get out of the country as fast as he could he was actually going to stay there and fight it out and once that became clear to the nation and he used his iphone day in day out on the streets of ukraine of kiev to show that he was there standing in front of famous uh, landmarks to prove that he was still there and that he was going to fight it out and that was the thing that um which is tremendously Churchillian. Of course, it's exactly what Churchill did in London in the Blitz in, in 1940, 1941, just without the iPhone. And, and it completely altered the nature of the conflict. You know, morale is absolutely key to any uh, to any war. And that's 
what we saw in um, in the book again and again, that morale is a, just like you mentioned, deterrence, the importance of deterrence and throwing money at deterrence, frankly, because uh, any amount of money you spend on deterrence is only a fraction of the amount of money that you'll have to spend if deterrence fails. Yeah. So also morale in a conflict is uh, completely crucial because once it's gone, it is very, very difficult to get it back. Yeah, I believe just pulling something from your Napoleon book. Doesn't Napoleon have a quote like "Morales were twenty thousand men or forty thousand men"? Yeah, mor- no, um, the uh, yeah, it's it, the uh, morale is is worth three to one. Yes, it's it, the the, mor- the moral is to the physical as three is to one is the exact quote. Yeah, uh, and it's that's- totally true. Speaking of a big concept you have in the book to tie back to the Ukraine, you mentioned what takes place in one part of the world reverberates in the other. And I believe you mentioned in the book that Putin wanted to make Russia great again, but an unintended consequence was he made NATO great again, or with Finland and Sweden joining NATO. Could you speak to that? Yes. Well, the, the idea about uh, how things reverberate around the world is is pretty clear. I don't think that Putin would have invaded Ukraine if he didn't think the West was weak. And one of the reasons he did think the West was weak was the United States pulled out of Afghanistan in the summer of um, 2021, very suddenly quitted the, the country, essentially, even though you hadn't lost a serviceman, American serviceman killed in, in 18 months. And and you weren't spending vast amounts of money compared to your multi-trillion military budget there. And yet you you seem to pr- tell the world, essentially, that America no longer had the will to uh, protect the Afghans. And so, of course, what the message that both President Xi uh, of China and also President Putin took from that was that the West was on the back foot and, and weak. And so he invaded. If we were to lose this, if the West was to lose this uh, war, then I think Xi would take very much take the um, message and probably apply it to uh, Taiwan. So it really is very important um, that, you know, the West should show strength uh, at the moment rather than uh, rather than weakness. I believe you mentioned get touching on China and Taiwan. I believe you mentioned in the book that you, you believe that one of the biggest or if not the biggest powder keg that may go off in the world is the China Taiwan situation. Can you speak to well, that? Pl- there are plenty around, around. At the time we were writing the book, of course, we didn't know that the horrors of Gaza, the, the monstrous uh, medieval level atrocities of the 7th of October were going to be unleashed on the world. But but yes, I mean, uh, and also there are things bubbling away in the Balkans that are not very nice at the moment as well. And all sorts of uh, powder kegs could be lit there once again. But of course, the thing that uh, could bring the two superpowers into direct conflict, which of course did not happen between America and Russia um, between uh, 1945 and the collapse of the Soviet Union. They never actually fought each other. They were all mm-hmm. fought uh, via proxies. Mm-hmm. But if Taiwan were to uh, be invaded by China, China, then you would get the two superpowers uh, facing off against each other with potentially cataclysmic uh, consequences for the world. And here's one big idea I saw also in the book. It goes throughout the seven decades. The surprise attack definitely rattles the host country but then yeah. if it's not a knockout blow it, it just the, the part that the, the people that get surprised like pearl harbor or something like that they come back with a vengeance could you speak to what you, you you're what you've seen there yeah it, yeah this is another very important thing is that surprise attacks ultimately although they can give very um, impressive short-term advantages in the long term unless as you say they they actually knock the country out which they haven't in the uh, history of surprise attacks they actually are counterproductive because it you wind up getting the the country that's been attacked has a sort of fire lit under it which requires vengeance and actually you are of course also uh, seeing this in every decade since the the one that you mentioned, Pearl Harbor. So in the 1940s, you have Pearl Harbor. Mm-hmm. In the 1950s, you have the Korean War, the surprise attack on South Korea by North Korea. Um, in the 1960s, the Six Day War, then the Yom Kippur War that we were talking about earlier. In the 1970s, um, the Argentinians invading the Falklands Islands mm-hmm. came as a complete surprise in 1980. 
two. You have nine eleven, mm-hmm. of course, and uh, and most recently this uh, monstrous uh, Hamas attack on southern Israel. So there's a there's a quotation in the book uh, by Paul Wolfowitz who said that the surprising thing about surprise attacks is that they happen so often in history that the that we shouldn't be surprised by them, yeah. and and yet you know we are. Um, now to apply that to what we were just talking about is not much of an analogy because if the Chinese want to invade Taiwan, they're not going to be able to do it by surprise. Um, there are the uh, underwater sensors. There's the capacity through satellites to see when the um, Chinese move the People's Liberation Army closer to Taiwan. There's uh, naval uh, maneuvers and reinforcements and so on. So it's not going to be a surprise attack. It's going to, it might be a quick attack, um, but it, it won't come as a, uh, it, it'll be shocking to people, but it won't be surprising. Mm-hmm. Let's move over to another big idea. The last chapter in the book, The Future of War. I talk about cyber, AI, deterrence. This book kind of gives a glimpse into what the wars of the future will be like. Could you speak to what your research, what do you think the future of war looks like looking forward? It's uh, completely terrifying, frankly. It's the chapter that uh, that is the one that's going to keep you awake at night. Yeah. yeah. And, the, <laughs> and the reason is that at the moment, of course, we have very highly advanced, technologically advanced um, systems, but you do have the human in the loop. And in the future, you're not going to. You're going to have the human on the loop, i.e. he's going to be making the, drawing up the algorithms that oversee the overall parameters of the of the fighting. But actually, if you have a human in a, in a fighter jet, for example, it will be shot down by the fighter jet that doesn't have the human in it and is, fast, is moving much faster in terms of... Uh, of tactical operation than the uh, than the one with the essentially far slower human, mm-hmm. and and you see this uh, with the drone on drone fighting that's going to take place in future wars. You will see this again and again in various aspects of uh, of warfare. Under sea drones, for example, are going to be very important. They already are becoming very important, actually, as we see in the Ukrainian war, and so. Yeah, it's it's a system where AI and robotics are going to be applied to the battlefield. There are advantages to it, of course, uh, the, the operational ones that I just mentioned. But also, you know, you don't have to write a letter of condolence to the parents of a robot oh, yeah. when uh, when uh, it's uh, destroyed on the battlefield. Robots show no fear. They show no cowardice or so, of course. They don't uh, show remorse or pity. They do what their their human on the loop is is telling them to do, and so it's a uh, and you once again you have to be at the absolute cutting edge, which is comes back to this idea that in order to deter, what you essentially want is for President Xi to wake up every morning and going no, and that this is not the day I'm going to attack Taiwan, mm-hmm. and any money spent on making sure that that happens is uh, is money well spent, and mm-hmm. if the West can stay at the absolute cutting edge of these latest technologies, then all will be well. But the, when it uh, slips behind, mm-hmm. then there's a very good chance that all hell's going to break loose. You have a quote from Vladimir Putin in the book. I thought it was pretty pretty pertinent. You mentioned a quote from him. It says, uh, this is from Putin, the country who wins the AI battle will be the ruler of the world. Yeah. And um you know he wants to rule the world <laughs> that's that's uh uh that's pretty clear when if he could he would uh and it would be a hateful vicious loathsome hobbesian kind of world for any of us to try to live in so let's uh let's make sure that he doesn't win the ai battle but in that in that sense he's he's of course he's right and another idea about the future war of cyber attacks, it's just going to keep, they're going to happen, they're going to be bigger, then they're just going to keep evolving and be more effective. What could cyber attacks look like in the future? What's your research show? Well, the good thing about this aspect is that there are some occasions, like in 2014 in Estonia, which we go into, that you get a surprise cyber attack. But actually, the Ukrainians... Uh, by the time of the uh, February 2022 
invasion were all over this uh, issue and they had defenses against cyber attacks and indeed they had uh, offensives through uh, cyber against various uh, Russian financial institutions and so on. So uh, again, this is an area that is not um, going to be a, um, uh, a surprise because the defences are, um, are, are kept up. But again, it's very expensive. You need to have you know, highly intelligent, uh, highly educated people who are very committed to ensuring that society doesn't break down because of the cyber attacks on financial institutions and uh, critical in- infrastructure and uh, nuclear facilities and, uh, oh, I don't know, reservoirs and all the other things that we need to um, ensure that human society can, uh, can operate. You mentioned in the book, are you and General Petraeus, the six dominions of warfare. Air, see if I got this right. Air, land, sea, cyber, information, and space. Um, talk about space. I, I remember back when I was real little, like Ronald Reagan, and they talk about Star Wars. It, it kind of started the end of the Cold War there. Space, like wh- where's that evolving to? What could you see happening there? Well, it's completely central, isn't it, to the GPS systems that... Uh, are used by every army in the world, absolutely epicentral. So if you were able to take down your enemy's um, uh, space satellites, you would send them back to having to fight with, you know, with maps, <laughs> essentially paper maps, and that would be catastrophic for for any army. So, um, so yes, expect a, a future war to, I know it sounds very sci-fi, and very Terminator, very, you know, futuristic, but nonetheless, it's not impossible that a uh, future war could be over very quickly as one side just takes out the space satellites of the other. Wow. And, and, uh, and also misinformation and disinformation you mentioned there as well. I mean, that is coming on leaps, leaps and bounds and not yeah. in a good way. Um, mm-hmm. Deep fakes, bots... Um, the way in which a something that is untrue yep. will be um, seven times more likely to be ret- retold Instagram than something that is true. There was an MIT uh, study on that. I don't know what it says about human nature, but whatever it is, it's not very. It's not very good. And, not good. And you can see certainly in the uh, days since the seventh of October last year, with the the sort of propaganda battle, the information battle between the Israelis and the Palestinians, that that has has tipped disastrously, uh, frankly, against Israel over the weeks after this these monstrous atrocities. So so it is, it is important. It does have a uh, essential influence over. Morale, which, as we as we pointed out earlier, is is to the physical as three years to one. Yeah. When you mentioned with the AI and and the drone on drone, and it's maybe sometimes human on drone, uh, you mentioned the concept or uh, of proportionality, like the Geneva Convention in the book. How can we keep the proportionality of like maybe not using excessive force when you have drones involved, and you have like when you have the non-human factor in? How can that? Well, well, that's where the algorithm has to kick in, obviously. I mean, we have had, in one area at least, which is the most important area of all, in fact, a good level of proportionality since 1945. And of course, that's nuclear weapons. You know, no side has used uh, nuclear weapons since 1945 because we recognise that there is no proportionality involved in using them. And you suddenly get into a new area. Of, of mass destruction that neither side wants to get into. So, you no, know, we do have that as uh, something to look to. But you're right, the chances of a war getting completely out of hand because a AI robot simply doesn't abide by normal human assumptions is ever present. In fact, can I just read you let me just go it's um, just something that i i cut out of newsweek the other day which is absolutely to this to this point about what the machine is capable of doing stay there one second yeah sure absolutely so um this is a newsweek account of a hypothetical exercise that took place last year in an american defense research establishment and the report of it. Uh, let me just read you the um, the report. It goes, we were training it in simulation. We're talking, this is an AI machine. We were training it in simulation to identify and target a surface-to-air missile threat. And then the operator would say, yes, kill that threat. The system started realizing 
that while they did identify the threat, at times the human operator would tell it not to kill the threat, but it got its points by killing that threat. So what did it do? It killed the operator. Wow. Wow. It killed the operator because that person was keeping it from accomplishing its objective. So those those uh, those um, algorithms have to be written very, very carefully. That's crazy. Oh, my gosh. That is that, that just that makes you think, oh, my goodness. Like, where is this all going? That is crazy. If you had to summarize this book in a sentence or two. Oh, sorry. Could I just before um, before I yeah. do that? Yeah, could I just have one other thing. Yeah, um, please. I've, I've been thinking about this. Uh, a bit. I'm. I'm going to be going to Henry Kissinger's memorial uh, service next week. He was a. He was a good friend, and uh, in his latest uh, book that he wrote with Eric Schmidt about uh, AI and robotics, he writes about how the computers are on the verge of being able to converse with each other in a code that humans can't crack. <laughs> that's another that's yeah. another very very worrying concept isn't it that is that's right out of the terminator that's that's right out of like a james cameron movie oh my goodness yeah. Yeah. wow and one moment with uh, dr kissinger he's the one guy like you follow like american politics every president that was elected like in my lifetime at some point like before like the point where they're president elect you see henry kissinger visit them like they have like from everyone has Henry Kissinger come in for like a day to talk to him. And he comes over this and, and like I think it was Trump, Obama. Everyone talks to Henry Kissinger. Like he was well, such you'd, a you'd, brilliant. You'd be mad not to, because yeah. he really was a an extraordinary fund of uh, of wisdom and experience, of course, going back to the 1970s. So um, you know, anybody who uh, achieved the things he did is is going to be worth listening to even if you don't actually wind up following his precepts which president obama didn't do terribly much i don't think president biden did very much either nonetheless they profited by talking to him if you had to uh, summarize this book in a sentence or two a learning or a principle how would you summarize the conflict book what, what, what will someone learn reading this I think they'll learn that the evolution of warfare since the death of Hitler has not been linear. Uh, it moves forward very fast, can move backwards as well. And I'd also say that the concept of strategic leadership is more important than any of the other factors in deciding whether a country is going to win or, or lose a war. Strategic leadership with the, getting the big ideas right and having that big strategic leader like a Churchill, Zelensky, uh, an FDR, whatever, whoever, someone in that place is, is so huge. Wow. So big. If we could move over to a quick part of the interview we call Share Your Secrets so our listeners can get to know you uh, a bit more as a person. A Andrew, um, it's a bit, well, it sounds rather nerve wracking, yeah, I have no. to say, uh, Joe. So, <laughs> these, okay. These are fun questions. How about this? Someone as busy as you, when you need to clear your mind or recharge your body, what do you do? Um, I uh, I read a uh, a detective novel. Um, really? That's the, uh, that's the best way. You know, uh, if you've got uh, hundreds of things all um, coming in on you, but you've nonetheless got um, a, a day or so to. Uh, to try and um, deal with them. I, I get a, a guy called Robert Goddard who writes these fiendishly complicated uh, um, murder mystery uh, kind of things, slash thrillers. They're very, very complicated and uh, they can completely clear your mind of uh, anything because <laughs> you have to concentrate on every word to see who done it. Oh, that's great. How about this? Is there a book? Um, obviously, you're a huge reader. Um, is there a book that influenced your life or changed your mind more than any other? Is there like a favorite book that you could go back to? Um, yes, I was I was um, uh, 19 years old when I read Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France. And it was a life changing experience for me. It was uh, as well as being absolutely beautifully written, it was a uh, a sort of beacon book uh, for me. It explained, and it was it was written, of course, in the uh, in seventeen ninety at the very beginning of the uh, French Revolution, uh, only a year after it had uh, 
it had broken out. It explained so much about uh, about history. It explained about actually the the Nazis and uh, the communists uh, takeover in 1917. Um, even though it was written hundreds of years before, uh, it was a, uh, a an absolutely um, awe inspiring uh, work of political philosophy for me. Wow, that's great! No, thank you for sharing that. How about this? Most successful people like yourself have a routine, either like kind of to start their day or end their day to get their mind right. What's your routine? You have, you have a way, you have a particular yeah, way. Yeah, mine start? is a bit, mine is a bit weird, uh, okay. Joe. Not to, no, I'm not suggesting to anyone they follow this. It's only because I've been doing this since I was at Cambridge University that I s- still do it. And my body is completely uh, tuned to it. But please don't try this at home is what I'm saying to your viewers. Uh, I I get up and start work at 4.30 in the morning. Um, It gives me five hours before anybody bothers you. Um, I go to the gym for an hour. Um, I then will uh, work on until lunchtime. And then I have a nap in the afternoon um, for uh, an hour, sometimes an hour and 15 minutes. Work in the afternoon, stop at six o'clock and uh, uh, and then go out and uh, have fun with friends and my have dinner with my family and all of that kind of thing, get an early night so that I can start again the next morning at uh, 4.30. If for any reason I start flagging in the afternoon when I'm actually writing a book, mm-hmm. sometimes the actual writing process can last for three months or so, mm-hmm. then I'll drink a Red Bull energizer drink in the nice. uh, afternoon it's not very good for you i don't think it it leaves you sort of it's high in caffeine needless to say and it, you sort of shake uh, uh, slightly but nonetheless it does mean that you can work on all the way through and i find that uh, i can write i can write six thousand words a day um doing, doing that yeah yeah that. so five thousand six thousand on on that regime um wow. and it uh it doesn't allow that much time for for anything else, frankly. But if you've got a long book to write, and some of my books are are rather long, I'm afraid, <laughs> um, then uh, then it's the way that works for me. Wow, six thousand of that. Let's touch on creativity for a second. For that, say you write six thousand words. What percent of those words will you use? compared to like all oh, uh, those 500 words were garbage. I'll try and use. Okay, say I've written six thousand words. I'll try and use. Um, five thousand of them, and my publisher will probably cut that back to to four thousand. <laughs> okay, oh, that's, that's so wow. Uh, and then a writing, and then your average. Say you're do you, um you, when you're writing a book, so it's six thousand words a day. That's what you hold yourself to when you're writing a book. I don't hold myself to it. If I you know can do more, I will. But it's it's wow. that's very very difficult to uh, do any more than that. That is uh, that is so impressive. Oh my gosh, that that crushes the Hemingway. Hemingway is like five hundred word, you know, or five hundred crappy words a day or something. There's some Hemingway quote, but that is amazing. Well, if I uh, if I managed to get a uh, scintilla of the sales of uh, his Hemingway, <laughs> I'd be I'd be a very happy man. <laughs> How about so, Andrew? As you look out to the year ahead, what what's the most exciting project you're working on now? Well, got this book, Napoleon and His Marshals that I'm writing, which I'm very excited about. I'm uh, I'm at the research stage, which for me is easily the most fun part of, um, of yeah. being a writer. I don't much like the actual process of of uh, writing. As you've just heard, it's it's yeah. a pretty sort of manic one. I don't hugely enjoy the publicising of books, although I must say I have enjoyed this afternoon very much uh, on your show. The thing I really love doing is the, is the research. And uh, luckily... I'm uh, able to do that. I'm going through Napoleon's letters. Uh, He wrote 33,000 letters, and a lot of them were to his marshals. And also, I'm looking at the marshals and the way they interacted with each other. And uh, the, the, quite a lot of them just hated each other, frankly. Wow. And oh, that always that always makes for uh, for good, interesting history. So, so that's my that's my project. I'm not able to spend as much time on it as I'd uh, as I'd like to because, as you mentioned earlier, I'm a member of the House of Lords, and so I do need to go into that's that's the thing that's rather upset the uh, regime uh, that I mentioned earlier because I need to be in Parliament from Monday to Wednesday, lunchtime to dinner time, and although I do get a chance in that to uh, to get down and 
and work on Napoleon, of course, there are debates and speeches and uh, votes and things like that, which one has to um, be present for. Yeah, sure. And then this new book from Napoleon that's coming out, with all the research you've done on your first Napoleon book, which was just epic, do you use any of that material into this or is this just completely new? No, no, it's got to be a completely different book because um, because the reader the reader deserves it, really. Uh, you know, you can't just uh, rehash stuff that you've um, done before. You've got to give a completely new new uh, account which yeah. isn't difficult because there's uh, so much mm -hmm. material uh mm -hmm. frankly um it's you're, you're you're inundated with uh material and so there's uh absolutely no need to self-plagiarize sure that makes sense how about wait, real quick before we uh wrap up what did you think of the napoleon movie the ridley scott movie Oh, I love the um, uniforms. I thought there were some lovely scenes. I enjoyed the, uh, the the battle scenes and the pretty dresses that the girls wore. They looked fabulous. And uh, and I loved all of that side of, side of things. The history was completely ridiculous. I'm afraid it was ludicrous from start to finish. The mistakes, the egregious error, historical errors that he didn't need to make. If he'd hired a historian he'd have been saved from just one jaw-dropping howler after another um i have written about this a bit uh in fact and um uh and it's a great shame you know 300 400 million pounds uh, sorry dollars spent on a movie like that could have produced a great historical epic but in fact it's instead produced something that uh is is uh quite fun to watch but actually tells you nothing at all about Napoleon. Gotcha. No, I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. How about this? So some, it's just a couple of questions here just to wrap things up. How about, Andrew, we discussed so much, seven decades of warfare, Napoleon, Churchill, strategic leadership. If you could have everyone listening take just one lesson away from everything we discussed, what would that lesson be? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it would be to support Ukraine in a war where America certainly is getting amazing return on investment by destroying the, by not having any American boots on the ground, but nonetheless, so far destroying some 60% of the Russian tank fleet, which is something that any time in the Cold War, if we were able to do for the outlay that's uh, been made, there's no president in the world wouldn't have leapt at it. Mm -hmm. um, that would be the ultimate uh, message, I suppose. Thanks for sharing that. F final two questions. These are fun ones. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. I'll be the judge of that, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the first one. Andrew, if you could spend the day with anyone, alive or dead, historical figure, famous, not famous, who would you spend the day with? Not sure. Winston Aren't Churchill, you? undoubtedly, oh absolutely. I, I would, I would, if you were able to offer that, I'd give you my little finger. You could get a guillotine and chop it off right now. Get one of those big cigar cutters and cut, cut it off right now. And I'd be thrilled if uh, I had the opportunity to, as a result, spend the day with with Winston Churchill. He is still, for me, the most um, fascinating personality. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'd only ever ask about three questions, uh, three three word questions, and he'd just talk and talk and talk. But nonetheless, if I'm allowed a word in edgeways, I'm not going to give you my finger unless I'm allowed a word in edgeways yeah. with uh, uh, with Churchill. But I'd love to sit down, uh, maybe after after a jolly good dinner with him, and yeah. uh, and talk through his life and his decisions and his sense of destiny and his you know great moments and low moments it would be it would be something that i'd adore having the I chance mean, to do just one of the epic people in all of history like uh, amazing that would be such an amazing day one of the things and i love sure and i have to say you know my my um, my biography of uh, churchill churchill walking with destiny sells better in america than in the whole of the rest of the world put together uh, he is a uh, he's still you know hugely admired in the united states and of course he was half american but it's it's wonderful i love i love getting the uh, sales reports on uh, uh, from uh, the united states it's such a, that book is so great. One thing, one quick thing on Churchill that I got from you that he hired people like to hire yes men 
he hired no men. I think it was like Field Marshal Allenbrook, where like he would just hired him and he would just push back on all of Churchill's ideas, like something yeah, like that. Yeah, he wanted, Churchill didn't want his ideas to uh, be put into practice unless they had been put through the ringer intellectually. And he was absolutely certain that they were going to work. And so what he did, which is very unusual for politicians, frankly, uh, was to go out of his way to hire people who he knew would disagree with him. And that takes an enormous amount of moral courage uh, to uh, to do that and intellectual self-confidence, needless to say. But boy, did it work because it meant that operations were very, very thoroughly gone through and gone over before they were undertaken. And uh, so I, uh, I admire Churchill for uh, appointing no men. So great. Talk about strategic leader and getting the big ideas right. Oh, my gosh. Like fight on the streets. Awesome. Last question. Andrew Roberts, if you had to get a quote or a saying tattooed on your body, <laughs> what, what, what would that quote or motto say? Um, <laughs> well, it would, it would certainly be, it would be, um, Tattooed in a place where very few people could see it, I can assure you of uh, of that. I would, I, I think I would, it's a, it's a quotation from Winston Churchill, in fact. Um, on the uh, day of the Queen, the late Queen's coronation in 1953, mm -hmm. he was walking across Westminster Hall, which is somewhere where I go to a lot, as you can imagine, in, uh, in Parliament. And a young American said to him, young sort of uh, young man, came up to him and, uh, and asked him for a piece of advice, life advice, essentially. And Churchill replied, study history, study history, for therein lies all the secrets of statecraft. And, and although I don't want a tattooist writing that whole second sentence, because it's quite a long one, and it sounds quite painful to have that on my, on my body, I would have the phrase, study history, study history. And indeed, when the king uh, made me a, a peer and I was able to uh, choose a motto for my coat of arms, um, that's what I chose, uh, study history. Wow, that is epic. Study history, study history. I think that is about as good as a spot as any to wrap this up. Andrew Roberts, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Thank you for your epic work. Thank you for books like this. And uh, it's just so amazing to speak with you, admiring your work from afar for so long. Andrew, if people are looking for you and what you do online, where can we find you? Yeah, I've, I've got a website and I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and all of those kind of things. So um, uh, yes, I'd, I'd like that very much. Thank you very much, Joe. I've really enjoyed it. And thank you so much for all those generous things you've said about my work. I, I hugely appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. And I was hoping when you write, when Napoleon comes out, your next book, hopefully you, we can have you back on to talk that. That would be an honor. I promise. I promise. I'd like that. I really enjoy that, in fact. Oh, Andrew, thank you so much. Wish you much success. It's been an honor, sir. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot, Joe. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye.